So today we'll talk a little bit more in depth about supervised learning and we'll start with some very simple supervised learning algorithms and um, more about the pipeline of supervised learning. A quick note on the homework that's uh, due on Wednesday. So there was a little bit of a misunderstanding on Piazza. So you don't need to generate a PDF of all your code. You have to just submit a zip file. Um, I don't think you can submit your repository because it's private, but you can submit a zip file of your repository. For task zero, you still need to have a PDF uh, that side. If you create a zip file of your repository, make sure not to include the .git folder. So if you take your folder and you like right click and say compress, it'll include that git file, but you don't usually, if you want to give someone just the content, you don't usually want to include that. Um, one way to do this is to do git archive, and with git archive you can export the repository as a zip file without including the .git folder. You could also make a copy of it and just remove the .git folder and then zip it if you want. But otherwise, uh, because there's like a bunch of files on there, uh, grade scope will struggle a little bit. Just, uh, the question is, should you have subfolders for different subtasks? No, just name them, okay. so that it's obvious. Like you can name them test one one or one two. All right. And so someone also asked, so there's no auto graded, it will all be manually graded. So um, don't worry too much to bu uh, about the naming. It's just so the CAs need to understand what's happening. All right, so let's go back to um, supervised learning. Again, uh, very briefly, the formal setup here is um, we have a joint distribution of uh, X and Y, and um, so X is our feature description of our data, Y is the desired output. Um, so we assume X is a real valued vector, and Y in this case would also be a real value, so this would, uh, for example, be a regression task, a classification task, yi, would be um, uh, possibly zero or one or minus one and one. Uh, and so what we're trying, we have um, samples. So this i stands for different samples. So let's say uh, x1 and y1 to xn and yn. So we have n data point samples and we want to find the function uh, f so that f from xy is approximately yi. So these samples are, uh, with the next i, are the training set that we collected and that we have the true labels for. And uh, we want a function, we want to learn a function that approximates um, the distribution well on the training set, but uh, that also generalizes to new samples that are drawn from the same distribution. All right, this is sort of pretty abstract and um, I'm not going to talk about any very complex algorithms for this, but I want to talk with some very, very simple and basic algorithms just so um, those of you that are not familiar get uh, an idea of what the flavor of these algorithms is. So possibly the most simple algorithms, uh, a simple algorithm for supervised learning is uh, nearest neighbor. And I'll actually start with um, nearest neighbors for classification. So imagine that um, on the scatter plot, the x and the y axis are the two features you have. So this is a two-dimensional data set, um, two real-valued features, and there's two classes, the red dots and the blue dots. And now you could say, um, you could ask a question, well, I observed a new point here where the black star is, or what this, or this black star is, and um, so you want to make a prediction, what do you think, what color should this star have? That's sort of the essence of a supervised learning uh, problem. You have this data set that is labeled and you get a new data point. Um, assuming it's from the same distribution, what class should it belong to? And um, so the nearest neighbor classifier, as I said, is a very, very simple classifier. The way this wor it works is um, the function for a new data point x, which is like one of these stars, is just the label um, of the, clo 
the closest data point in the training set. So you look at the distance between the new point and all the points in the training set, and then you just give it the label of this point. So here in this case, um, for this star, this red point was the closest, for this one the blue point was the closest, for this one the blue point was the closest, and so according to the um, near one nearest neighbor algorithm, this would be uh, the predictions made for these stars. So now what we want to do next is let's say uh, we want to use this algorithm. We need to figure out are these predictions any good? So um, should we trust this algorithm? The way this is usually done is um, by um, trying to evaluate uh, the generalization performance of this algorithm. Simple way to do this is to take your data set that you collected and split it into a training and a test set. Now, we only use the training set um, as the data set for building the algorithm, and we use the test set as a holdout set uh, that stands in for future unseen data. And so we train the algorithm on the training set. Uh, let's say we use 75% of the data to train the algorithm and 25% of the data um, as a test set. And um, then for the, uh, the test set, we also have the uh, known outputs. So we can check, does our algorithm match uh, the, pr the known labels? And um, let's say we find out that our algorithm is correct 90% of the time on the test set, then we expect the algorithm to also be correct 90% of the time on any new data. Of course, the test set wasn't observed by the algorithm before. It's basically, yeah, it looks to the algorithm like new data. This, of course, is only like uh, a cartoon illustration. Um, usually, you would have like hundreds of data points at least. So, here's how we would do this with scikit-learn. Um, I don't think we talked about the scikit-learn API before, so uh, or at least not too much. Um, so, I'll briefly walk through this. So there's some utility functions I could learn to do the splitting and training and test data set, um, which is like a really very simple operation, but you need to do it so often that um, we have this train test split function. This just shuffles the data, um, both the labels and the targets. So basically it shuffles the rows in X and um, then splits them 75, 25 in the training and test set. And you can change the fractions if you want. So if you want to use the uh, k-nearest neighbor classifier, um, all the algorithms in uh, scikit-learn are implemented in Python classes. So first we need to instantiate the class. Um, these classes encapsulate both the uh, training algorithm and the prediction algorithm, and they store anything that was learned during data, uh, from the data during training. So, um, so here I import the class, uh, k neighbors classifier. Um, here I instantiate it. An instantiation is when you set any hyperparameters. Most supervised learning models or most machine learning models overall have uh, tuning parameters. So here I tell it we are only interested in looking at, at the one closest neighbor. So then we get this KNN object that um, will encapsulate our machine learning process. All the models in scikit-learn have a fit method. The fit method is was what uh, builds the, the model and always takes the, um, the training data set as an NumPy array. And if it's a supervised task like here, it also takes the training labels. Um, so here, this builds the model and stores it in the KNN object. In this case, um, the model is just memorizing all of the training data. Because when you see a new, new point, you um, try to find the closest point in the training data. So there's not really a model, you just store all the training data. Um, now we want to evaluate how well does this do on uh, the whole test set, and we can use the score method here. So kn.score uh, on x test and y test, this computes the prediction on the test data set according to this model, and then compares them to y test. Um, 
for classification, the score method always computes accuracy. So that's the fraction of correctly classified samples. And so here we can see that the accuracy on this like two-dimensional toy data set of this algorithm was 77%. For illustration purposes here, I also show the predict method. If we actually want to get the predictions by the model, we use the predict method. Um, so k and n dot predict, we can apply this to any data set, uh, x test or x strain. And here y pred would be the predictions according to the model. The score method internally calls predict and then compares predict to y test basically. Questions about what's happening here? So if the, the number of neighbors were, for example, two, this would get the mean of the, the two neighbors? The question is what happens if the number of neighbors is not one, and that's on the next slide. So what does this save in y pred in the last line? Um, okay, the question is what is saved in y pred in the last line? So this is uh, the prediction according to the model. So here, actually, I didn't show you what's in Y. I think Y probably here has zeros and ones that mean blue or red. And so Y pred will be um, a one-dimensional vector for each point X test in the test data set. It says zero or one, whether the model says it's red or blue. All right, so this was our data set with our predictions, but as already observed, uh, we could think of using more than one neighbor. Um, let's say we use three neighbors, what happens uh, now is we take, uh, we let the three nearest neighbors vote. Uh, so we look at the three nearest neighbors in the training data set and we let them vote what is the most common class among them and we take the majority class. Um, I created this data set actually randomly and was quite surprised when this happened. If you, you can see that if you go from one neighbor to three neighbors, actually all the predictions flip. Um, so that's great. So here for this data point, for example, we have these three nearest neighbors, two are blue, one is red. So this becomes a blue uh, prediction. For this one, these three are the three nearest neighbors. Um, so two are red, one is blue, so this becomes red, and so on. And obviously I could do this for any number of neighbors. Um, so yeah, the obvious question now is what is the right number of neighbors that we should use? This is um, an example of as I said, a hyperparameter. So this is not something you typically learn from the training data set, but something you have to, have to set. And we'll talk about uh, today how do you pick these kind of hyperparameters, and we'll talk about this for every model in this class we're gonna go through over the next couple of weeks, because it's actually quite important. Before we do this, I wanna visualize a little bit the effect that the number of neighbors has um, by visualizing the decision boundaries. So what I did here is, for each point in the 2D plane, um, I used that point as a test sample and asked the model what a prediction is there. And I did it for one neighbor, for five neighbors, for 10 neighbors, for 30 neighbors. So for example, for the point over here, the, predict the model says this would be blue, for this point over here, the model says it would be red. So here, this is um, a very nice way to visualize for all points in the plane what the model thinks. Uh, I like these kind of plots uh, of 2D decision functions because I think they illustrate how the models work. You can, unfortunately, you can never do this in real life because your data set is never two-dimensional. So um, a lot of people ask me always after they take my workshops or something, okay, so how do I do this for my data set? You can't. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's really hard to visualize higher dimensional decision boundaries, but I think it's good to do this in 2D to get some intuition. All right, so here, if we look at um, one neighbor, we see that there's, this is like a lot of uh, wild zigzag going on, and you can see that for each uh, point in the training set, there's like a small island of that, that color around them, or a big island in this case. So points here, for example, would be predicted as blue by the model. If you increase the number of neighbors, you can see that it becomes more and more just sort of a horizontal line, which is maybe what I would uh, have more intuitively said the, the, the distinction between blue and red is. So here this model says, okay, everything at the top is kind of blue and everything at the bottom is kind of red. Um, you can see already here, this point was 
the, this point in the training set would be misclassified by the uh, model, and these points in the training set would be misclassified as well. So here you can see um, something that is very common with all kinds of machine learning models is that you have a parameter that allows to control how complex of a model you want to fit. And um, in a little bit uh, counterintuitively maybe, the most complex of these models is the uh, n neighbors equal to one, um, which basically memorizes the whole training set and it does perfectly on the training data set. But then it has a basic the way, uh, the reason I call this complex is, be is because it has a very complicated explanation of how the classes look. Whereas um, if I use uh, more and more neighbors, it gets smoothed out more and more. And so here this explanation in, in some sense is a little more simple because it's more smoothed out, but now you're misclassifying more of the training points. So, um, oh, if we uh, increase the number of neighbors even more, basically at some point you would just predict the majority class. Um, so if we used, I don't know, 100 neighbors, which is probably all the data points, then we just would always predict the same thing, which is the majority class. And you can think of, this is sort of the most simple model we can think of. So the more neighbors I use, the sort of, the more simple it, the decision boundary gets. Here is um, what happens when we evaluate all of these different num values of number of neighbors uh, using training and test set. This is like a toy data set, so don't take this plot too seriously because it's mostly dominated by noise. But uh, there are some tendencies here that are um, that you can see that are generally sort of true. So here, if the number of neighbors is very small, you can see on the training set in blue, we do quite well. And as we increase the number of neighbors, we kind of do worse on the training set, which is what we also saw on the plots. Um, in terms of test scores, uh, we can see that, I mean, they're all pretty noisy, but um, they're sort of kind of average. Then around 20, they get better. And then if I go higher, they get much worse. Because this is such a noisy plot, I'll show you sort of a cartoon version of this that um, I, I like to show. This is the same plot, only uh, flipped. And um, it is sort of what you observe in nearly all supervised machine learning tasks if you tune the parameters. So here on a training set, this is a training set accuracy, so high is good. Uh, if your model is very simple, your accuracy will be too low. If you restrict your model too much, you will not be able to make good predictions on a training set. If you always predict uh, the majority class, uh, it's clearly too simple and you can't be, do well. If you allow yourself to have a more and more complex model, you'll get better and better. If you, in the end, allow yourself to basically memorize the whole training set, you can make perfect predictions. So more model complexity means better training uh, accuracy. But um, if we look at what happens on new data, say the test set, the, uh, what we can see is that, well, if the model is too simple, it does uh, similarly worse or similarly badly as on the training set. As we increase model complexity, the model will get better and better. However, at some point, we make our model too complex for the information that's in the data. And we're basically building a model that's very specific to the noise that we observed in the training set. And th at that point, um, the model starts to de degenerate and the generalization performance goes down. And somewhere in the, uh, in the middle there, there's sort of a sweet spot where we have the optimal generalization performance. And this is the model we generally search for. Um, if your model is too simple, that's uh, often called underfitting, and if your model is too complex, it's uh, often called overfitting. And um, looking at both your training and your generalization score, you can maybe get some idea of where your model is. Is it too simple, is it too complex, or is it just right? 
So one thing that's typical is that if your model um, is very simple, the training and the test performance will be very similar because um, the model is not very expressive, so it can't take too much information from the training set. But as, as you allow yourself more and more complex models, usually there's a wider and wider gap between the training and the generalization performance. In other words, if you find yourself um, that they're basically a training generalization or the training test score are about the same, that probably means your model might be too simple. If they're very far apart, it might be mean your model is too complex. Um, so th that's also like what is far apart and what is close together is a little bit relative. But that's sort of general guidance. So here I'm talking about model complexity as an abstract concept, uh, not measured. There's ways to de mathematically define model complexity, but I don't actually want to do this here. Um, so you can think of um, model complexity as the number of neighbors, where many number of neighbors is a simple model and few number of neighbors is a very complex model because it gets you a very zig zigzaggy decision boundary. Um, for each model, there's some way to tune this, and um, I'll show you a different model where we'll see what this corresponds to next. Um, in, if you're familiar with linear models, this could be the regularization strength of the linear model. If you're familiar with trees, it could be the depth of the tree. Uh, as we walk through the models in the next couple of weeks, I'll talk about what this means for each particular model. That basically means how much do you allow your model to memorize the training set. Other questions? Okay. So there's another model that I want to talk about, um, which is not very commonly used, but which I also like because it's quite simple and uh, helpful for understanding some of the concepts, which is the nearest centroid model. This is the same uh, core data set, and um, so. The nearest, what a near centroid model does is it just computes the mean or the centroid of um, the, each class and then it checks which mean is closer. This is clearly, again, this is like something very, very simple. This will always result in, like, in a di linear decision boundary, as you can see here. I'm not sure if you can see this well. There's um, a blue cross here, which is the mean of the blue points. There's a red cross here, which is the mean of the red points. And, um, this is the, bu the boundary found by this algorithm. Here's how you would implement this with uh, scikit-learn. Uh, very similarly, uh, we split our data into training and test set. We import the nearest centroid model. We instantiate it. I didn't set any hyperparameters here. I fit it on the training and test set, and then I compute the test score. And it's 62% accurate. Yep? Um, it was a little bit hard for me to imagine what the nearest centroid, centroid model um, would be applied for because it's such a simple model and there are clearly better alternatives. Do you, do you have an application in mind? OK, the question is, uh, when would you use that because it's such a simple model? That's a simple doesn't mean that it's bad. And um, I mean, it's probably not what I would use in most applications, but uh, it's actually n not that much simpler than a linear model, and linear models are used a lot. Um, I mainly want to use it here because it is, in a sense, quite similar to linear models, but it's much easier to understand what's going on here. And um, I mean, one reason where one uh, place where you might think this is good is where computational speed is very important because this is clearly blazingly fast. You need a linear scan through a data set and you just need to sum up. And so if speed is of utmost important or memory, um, this would be great. But yeah, usually I would probably use linear models, but they have actually quite similar properties to this, but this is easier to understand. Oh, maybe one thing that I should note about this, which I'm gonna talk about in linear models again. So here, if you plot a thing in 2D, linear models look way too simplistic. It's just a line. If you do this in higher dimensional spaces, 
linear models are very complex because there's more dimensions in which you can like go. And so um, if you have in higher dimensional spaces, this model would actually be quite flexible in a sense. So you shouldn't always like, uh, these 2D images are quite limited in the sense that um, things that are complex in higher dimensions don't really, um, you can't really see this in these low dimensional projections. Okay, the question is, is there a way to find the optimal number of neighbors? And that's what most of the rest of this class is about. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna repeat the question because the next slide will answer it. Um, so, Okay, this is a very simple model. So there, let's uh, look at the slight variant of this model because I want to talk about hyperparameter, which is a near shrunken centroid. So here, what we're doing is uh, we compute the mean, and then after we compute the mean, we um, put the mean through this thing, which is called the soft thresholding function. So here, for example, everything that's below 0.5, we set to zero. And uh, outside of 0.5, we just make it a linear function. So basically, we um, do the, ma the sign times the maximum value of 0 and x minus 1.5. Okay, I think the, the plot is probably better than saying this out loud. Um, and so the goal here is to restrict this sort of simple model even further, because um, that basically says if my mean doesn't have a lot, uh, is it not a lot different from zero in one direction, then um, I'm just gonna not look at this dimension at all. So if, so this is sort of just computing the means. If I shrink it a little bit, then you can see the, the thing becomes more uh, horizontal or more axis parallel and um, if I shrink it even more, then basically um, the x-axis gets completely ignored and the classifier only um, looks at the y-axis. And so here, um, maybe in two dimensions, so it's very, very simple now in higher dimensions, you could think about how it might make sense to select only some of the directions in your future space. And so here, you also have um, a tuning parameter, which is what is the threshold, how much should we sh shrink our means towards zero. Oh, in practice, you don't really shrink it towards zero, you shrink it towards the mean of the whole data set. But you can assume, or basically, you subtract the mean of the data set before you do this operation. If like zero is somewhere over there, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you want zero to be in the center. So, before we go more into um, tuning parameters, I want to very briefly give you some uh, a comparison of these two methods. They're both very simple and probably not what you would use in practice, but I think they both illustrate a lot of very interesting properties of machine learning algorithms. Um, because they sound kind of similar, but they're actually uh, quite different. So first, what, what kind of computation do you need to do for each of these? So, for the, uh, this is for the nearest centroid. So, fitting the model means computing the mean of each class. So here n is the number of samples and p is the number of features. So during fitting, I just need to compute the mean for each class, which is basically I need to touch each data point once and compute the mean. The memory is a uh, number of classes times p. I need to store a mean for each class. So that's actually probably the lowest memory you can have for any algorithm. Well, not, not entirely, but it's like a very low memory. The memory is not dependent on the training data size at all. It's only dependent on the number of features and the number of classes. And um, 
for prediction, I need to compare my new data point with each of the means. And so that means I need to compute uh, Euclidean distance from the data point to each of the means. So this is um, number of classes times p again. So this is, as I said, this is like really fast and nice uh, because it's very compact uh, and it's very fast to predict. So for, uh, let's look at nearest neighbors. So fitting in nearest neighbors is uh, no time because you just need, like this is the naive version, is no time, you just store a, a train data set. The memory, is sort of nearly the worst case, which is n times p, which is um, number of samples times number of features. You just store the whole training data set, which is pretty big. And then if you um, predict, the prediction time is also n times p because you need to compute the distance to each point in the training data set. This is actually the reason why I would never use this is because the prediction time scales linearly with the number of training samples. So if you have a very big training data set, this will take forever to predict. What does O mean? O. The question is, what does O mean? Um, basically, it means the time is bounded by a linear function in this. So it's a measure of complexity that's used in computer science. Um, so it basically just says com uh, the complexity will be a linear function of this with some constant that I don't write and some offset that I don't write. But uh, if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend looking up on Wikipedia. It's uh, quite important and complex in talking about complexities. Memory is how much you need to store. store and, and predict is how much time you need to do or how much computations you need to make a uh, prediction. So you could, they don't need to be related at all. Uh, like you could do a very complicated prediction. If you, like you could do something very complicated in a prediction. Here we're not, here we're just computing distances. And, and Sorry? Number of classes in the training data set. Okay, yeah, so um, said so fitting here for the nearest neighbor is no time, but predicting means comparing to e uh, the distance to each um, data point. Um, you, you can do this a little bit smarter using KD trees. Um, I realized that, okay, who here knows what the KD tree is? Okay, well, yeah, that, that's what I expected. Uh, I'm kind of sad that this is not in the algorithms class and I still need to com convince Eleni to put it in. But um, it's basically a smarter data structure that works for um, um, spatial queries. So uh, if you have something, if you want to um, get neighborhood relationships, you can build this data structure and then it's faster to do queries. Um, this actually, is faster in low dimensions, um, but in high dimensional, this doesn't really work well anymore. So you can make it a little bit faster, but it doesn't really scale to more dimensions. So the, in, in a sense, these two models are kind of opposite because one does all the computation and fitting, the other one all in predicting. Also, the near centroid is very simple, whereas the k nearest neighbors is actually very, uh, very flexible and can basically memorize any training data set. These are properties of two classes of models that you will see quite a bit, which are called parametric and non-parametric models. This doesn't have to do with hyperparameters. Both of these had like the hyperparameters that we need to tune, which was the threshold or the number of samples. This has to do with what do you actually learn uh, so this is a little bit related to the memory, or it's quite related to the memory. In a parametric model, you say, I have a fixed number of parameters, say the means of the classes, or the linear coefficients in my model. 
and um, so you have a fixed number of degrees of freedom that's independent of how much data you observe. So these are the parameters. So this is a parameter in a statistical sense. In a non-parametric model, the degrees of freedom increase with more training data. And uh, so if I have my nearest neighbor model, that if I add more and more data, I can model more and more complex things. Uh, no matter how complex my data is, if I just add more data, I will be able to model more complex things. And um, it's kind of interesting to think about in, in uh, these concepts, um, because they actually have like quite, quite different properties in how you control complexity. So um, a common example of a parametric model would be a linear model. A common example of a non-parametric model would be a decision tree or a random forest. So the uh, decision tree, if you add more data, you can just grow deeper and deeper, and you can learn arbitrary complex things. And both have their pros and cons. Um, neural networks don't really fit in this so neatly because neural networks are really weird and no one understands them. Because neural networks kind of have a fixed number of parameters, but usually the number of parameters in a neural network is larger than the number of points in the training data set. Or sometimes it is larger than the number of points in a training data set. So there's more degrees of freedom in the model than there's data, and that's kind of weird. Anyway, so um, coming back to the underfitting and overfitting, usually non-parametric models are more likely to overfit because they can um, model arbitrary complex things and you basically need to um, go back and make them simpler, like looking at multiple neighbors or the, uh, restricting the depth of a tree so to make sure they don't overfit. Whereas um, parametric models are more likely to be too simple and often you need to th do things like add features to make them model something more complicated. For parametric models, very often the number of degrees of freedom is very closely tied to the input dimension. And so as I said, in higher dimensional spaces, um, even parametric models can be quite flexible. Um, here's a very simple example of a 2D data set where you can see sort of flexibility versus not flexibility where um, because near centroid is restricted to a linear um, decision boundary, the, uh, it can basically not model this uh, pretty simple task. But then again, this is um, 2D doesn't really tell the whole story of how things uh, work in higher dimensions. But you can see clearly for something that is uh, in low dimensions and is sort of slightly complex, the nearest uh, centroid can't model it. All right, so this is enough about these two models, and I just uh, want you to keep in mind these two different kinds of models and these two model families and what sort of properties they have. And now I wanna go back to um, tuning hyperparameters. So we said for um, picking hyperparameters, or I'm sorry, for evaluating a model, what we do is we split our data set into a training and a test set. And um, so one thing we could do is, um, as was, I think, uh, suggested, um, we try out all possible different values. So we rebuild the model in our training set with one neighbor, with three neighbors, with five neighbors. Uh, even numbers of neighbors doesn't make a lot of sense for um, two classes. So I'm saying only odd numbers. Um, and then we can try which one is the best on the test set. This would be um, a reasonable strategy for finding a good number of neighbors. However, it's not a good strategy for evaluating how good the model actually is. If I try out many, many different models on the test set, then whatever um, model I pick, the test set will be too optimistic in measuring this performance because I picked the best one on the, pest, on the test set. So then the test set is not an unbiased estimate of 
future performance anymore because I already made use of the information in the test set. Um, this is somewhat related to doing uh, multiple hypothesis testing errors. If you uh, test enough hypotheses, at some point we'll find one that's significant. And so if I try enough classifiers, at some point I will find one that by chance does well on the test set, but this will not um, generalize to new data. Okay, so what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna use a three-fold split where we split our data set into a training set uh, for model fitting, a validation set for picking the parameters, and a test set for evaluating. And um, before we go through this in more detail, I want to have an example to illustrate uh, why we need this. So here um, I'm using the breast cancer data set that's built into scikit-learn. I scale it. Um, we're gonna talk about, so this is not the right way to scale it. I just wanted the slide to be simple. We're gonna talk about scaling, I think, all of Wednesday, or most of Wednesday. Um, so I split the data here twice now, so I have a test set, a validation, and a training set. I split it twice by calling train test split twice. And so now I fit it on the training data set, and then I evaluate it on the validation and test data set. Actually here, um, there's like some difference between the two, because the data set is tiny, and there's basically statistical noise in um, how I split the data. So let's say, um, I, let's pretend I didn't do a three-fold split and I split only twice. And um, I'm gonna adjust the parameter now. That's a little bit artificial. I'm, um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna add, take my training set, I'm gonna fit a nearest neighbor classifier, and the parameter I'm gonna um, choose is the random seed for adding some noise to the training data set. In practice, you would never do this, but uh, bear with me. So I uh, iterate over th a thousand different random seeds. I create some random noise, and I add it to the training data set, and I fit the model, and then I record the validation and the, and the test score. So I did this to illustrate, basically, if I try it often enough, I will find a good model. If I just random, like, fuzz the randomness a little bit, if I shake the box a little bit with the data, then at some point I will get something that's perfect on the validation set. <coughs> so here, if I look at all these models, the maximum on the validation set is one. At some point I added the noise in a way that was just right for the validation set. But um, that doesn't mean it's gonna be good on the test set, right? This noise is like, contains no information at all. And so if I look at it, so, um, if I use this to pick a, like a more useful parameter, it might still, in this case, it would still give me a too optimistic a number. And I need this test set to tell me how will it actually perform on new data that wasn't involved in the selecting procedure. And you can see that on the test data set, this algorithm is, uh, or this model is actually uh, worse than what it was before. Because the thing that I added was like completely useless, it just, by chance, worked well on the validation set. And so, it's maybe a little bit of code to go through here, but um, you should sort of uh, maybe go back to the slide later and think about what's happening here because I think it's actually quite, quite illustrative. All right, so instead, so that's why we're using the three-fold split. We, we use the validation set to select the parameters and then we use a test set to figure out, is this model actually good? Do we want to put it into production, yes or no? So this threefold split is actually the, the simplest way we could do this. And we're going to talk about a couple other uh, ways we could do this. Um, so th this is nice because this is very simple and fast. It's easy to understand. Um, but the problem with it is that it has pretty high variance because you split the data set twice, and so depending on how you split the data, your numbers may vary. If you shuffle the data and split it again, you'll get different numbers. Also, um, a lot of your data is used in this validation test, which means you have less data to 
actually build the model. Obviously, you want to use as much data as possible to build the model, but if you make the validation test set too small, you will have even more variance in the evaluation. All right, so let's say we want to, um, but we want to use a threefold split for parameter selection. Um, this is more code to illustrate. This is, you probably wouldn't implement this yourself usually, but so let's say we split our data again into two, three parts, the test set, validation, and training set. So actually, let me go through this again. So first we split it into a test set and a set that's gonna be training and validation. Then we split the training and validation set again into training and validation. Now, I want to record all the validation scores for all the number of neighbors that I want to try. So here, I uh, start from one to, oh my God, I can never remember. I think it's one to 13, um, in steps of two. And for each of the number of neighbors in, these, in this range, I build a model, I put it on the training set, and then in the validation scores, I um, store the score of on the validation set of this model. Then I compute the maximum of the validation scores and I figure out which of the number of neighbors gave me the best validation score. So here this is a validation score, the best number of neighbors is 11. Then I can retrain the model with the best number of neighbors. Um, I'm gonna actually use now uh, the training and the validation data together so I could just take this best model that I had here and just apply it to the test data, but I can actually use more data if I rebuild the model using the training and the validation data together, assuming that the same value of number of neighbors is still a good value. Oh no. So I rebuilt the model using these parameters that I selected, and then I evaluated on the test set. Evaluating it on the test set will now give me an unbiased estimate of how well this work will work on future unseen data. So, so this is sort of the simplest way. We will, oh, I think I have to speed up a little bit. But, um, so we will now talk um, more about different ways how we can improve upon this strategy. So what we're not gonna talk about is better things than brute force search. So here, um, what we're doing is we try out all possible parameter settings, which is in a sense a little bit uh, silly. So maybe if we have time at the end of the semester, I might talk about something better than brute force search, but this is actually something that work is used very heavily in practice. The problem is that um, the dependence of the model on the hyperparameter is like, usually a very complex function that's very hard to optimize and you don't have uh, gradients and so if you know anything about optimization this is like if you don't have gradients it's a non-convex optimization problem so basically there's no chance um, there are some ways to do something better than brute force search but brute force search is sort of the go-to um, if you have many many parameters and uh, brute force search can take a long time. What people often do is random search. So they randomly pick uh, parameters instead of trying all possible combinations. And yeah, if we have time, we can talk about why this is uh, slightly better. But um, in most settings, you can't really do something very smart. It's very hard to get better than doing a random search. All right. so. As I said, uh, doing this threefold split has bad use of data and high variance, so let's do something better than this. What we're gonna do is we will use cross-validation. Who here is familiar with cross-validation? Okay. Um, still gonna walk through it. <laughs> um, so imagine this, the horizontal is your training data set, and so what we're gonna do is instead of doing a single split of the data, we split the data into, say, five equally sized uh, parts. We declare one of the parts the test set and the other ones the training set. So, uh, so now for my first split I use uh, these four parts as the training set, this one as the test set, I build a model, I compute a validation score on this gray part. 
then I declare the second uh, hardness flex or second fold my test data set and I use the right bits to train the model, I get another score and so on. So I train five different models on five different subsets of the data. I test them on five non-overlapping subsets of the data and so I get five scores. Um, this is more stable because um, it's less dependent on the split. In particular, each data point is in the test set exactly once. If we only do a single split, some points are in a training set, some points in a test set, here each point will be in a test set. Um, potentially, we can also use more data to build our model. Um, if we use five folds, we have 80% of the data uh, for training. If we use 10 folds, we have 90% of the data for training each time. You also have some measure of uncertainty. So here you get five numbers instead of just getting one numbers. So you can look at, I mean, five numbers are not a lot, but you could look at the distribution of these numbers. You can look at the median of them. You can look at the standard deviation. And this give, if, um, if your accuracy on one of these splits is one and on another split it's uh, 50%, then you know that um, your model is very unstable and uh, you should probably like figure out what's happening. So you get some measure of uncertainty. Next slide. Other question? So when we do this, we basically have five models at the end of the day. Yes, so, so okay, the question is, we have five models. Which one are we going to use? Uh, the answer is none of them. So this, what the outcome of cross-validation is basically these five accuracy numbers. So you get five numbers that tell you how good is this model. And these numbers together, like even their mean or median, is a more robust estimate of how good this kind of model is on this kind of data set. But you don't, you could use one of these models or you could use the average of all of these models, but that's not usually what we do in practice. We wanna talk about what we're gonna do in practice and on the next slide, which is, so this is, this is something, the trust validation, basically it um, replaces one of the splits. So um, instead of doing a uh, split into training and test data set, we could do this, we have many splits. But uh, we have this threefold split. And so what we usually do in the threefold split is we replace the inner part by cross validation. So if you want to do parameter selection, so you, you could do cross validation on the whole training data set, but if th that would not be a good idea if you want to do parameter selection. If you just want to evaluate your model, you can do cross validation on your whole data set. You'll get out five numbers, you compute the median, and you say, this is how well this model performs. But if you want to uh, tune parameters, you still need to have a separate test set. So um, the strategy that I usually use or recommend is you have your data set, you split it into a training and a test data set, you use the training data set uh, to find the parameters, and you use cross-validation on your training data set. And um, you can do this to find parameters, you can do this com to compare different models, so I can do cross-validation with my um, nearest neighbors and with my nearest centroid and with my random forest and with my neural network and I compare all of these numbers and then I pick the one that is best in a cross-validation and uh, once I pick that I can use the test data set to evaluate how well will it do in the future. Yes, so the question is uh, when you pick your model, wouldn't you train on the whole training data? Yes, I mean, that tie, ties into what the uh, question before was, with which model you use. So here the cross-validation gives you five models. And you're not, so what we do in Cycle Balloon is we throw away all of, these, all of these five models, we just use the best parameter setting, we retrain the model on the whole training data set. So here's how you would, if you would implement this yourself. This is just for illustration purposes, um, because it's actually implemented directly in Scikit-Learn. But so, let's say you wanted to implement this yourself. What you would do is you split your data set into a training and test set. And uh, for each number of neighbors, you have your uh, nearest neighbor classifier, you set the number of neighbors to I. Um, cross file score, 
is a function that computes cross-validation. So the return value of this is gonna be, in this case, I'm doing tenfold cross-validation, so it's gonna be the 10 numbers, which are 10 accuracy values on the 10 splits. Um, I compute the mean of those and I store it. So now I compute the maximum of these validation scores in the argmax. So the argmax tells me which is the best, uh, which parameter setting has the best mean validation score. And it's nine neighbors. And the mean validation score is uh, 0.967. So now I have this um, parameter value nine, and now I can go back and train my nearest neighbor classifier again using the whole training set, and then um, score it on the test set. And this test set score is now an unbiased estimate of how well this model will perform in the future, in the future. Here they are very close. That's kind of, I mean, um, basically, this is all just to illustrate the principle. These numbers are all very noisy because it's all toy data sets. Does this answer the question? Um, so just to look over the workflow again. So you start out with a set of either parameters or models you want to try. So let's say which model you want to use is also a hyperparameter. Maybe I should say I'm very uh, casual in using parameters, hyperparameters interchangeably. Um, depends which part, part of which community you are. In statistics, parameters are usually the coefficients of your model. So the parameters in linear regression would be the coefficients in linear regression. Uh, when I talk about parameters, I usually mean hyperparameters, which are the things that you don't learn from training data. If at any point it's unclear which ones I mean, um, uh, please ask. Usually, whenever I say parameters, I mean hyperparameters. Okay, so you have your hyperparameters or, or different models you wanna try. If a data set, just put the data set to training and test data. You do cross validation on the train data set to figure out the best parameter value in the best model. You retrain your model on the training data set. And then you do a final evaluation on the test data set. Sorry? Oh, your question is does this apply to two different models? Yes. Um, I mean, which model to choose is also just another hyperparameter. Um, you can run cross-validation over as many things as you want. Um, so I don't know who of you have started uh, doing some Kaggle competitions. One thing you see very often in Kaggle competitions is it's called overfitting the leaderboard, um, where people sort of do this, but they look at the test data too often. And so if you, but, uh, do the cross-validation your model selection, but you don't, sorry, if you do your cross-validation your parameter selection, and then you look at the test data set 100 times, you're again overfitting to the test data set, and you're using the information of the test data set. So in Kaggle, you have this leaderboard of like, who's performing the best right now, and um, you can see who's doing the best on the validation data set, and then at some point they flip it, and you can see who's doing the best on the actually test data set that I didn't show you so far. And you can see the people that try it very often try to go up higher and higher on this board. Every time you, you try a new model, you look at the test data set. And so you overfit, or sorry, on the validation data set, and you overfit the validation data set. And then if you try this too often, once they flip to the holdout test data set, you go down 100 places. And so maybe uh, it's a good learning experience to know, uh, only look at the test data set ideally once. So, as I said before, uh, this is all implemented in scikit-learn. It's implemented in the grid search uh, CV class. It does basically all of this flowchart that I showed. You only need to do the filling and training and test data set yourself. So, to use grid search CV, as I said, you split your training data set, uh, sorry, you split your data set in your training and test. What I also do here is actually train test split has an option called stratify. Um, this means it will make sure that the, um, 
distribution of class labels is the same in a training and a test data set. So I'm not splitting entirely random. I'm splitting uh, random, but I want to make sure that the distribution, if, like if it's, uh, let's say you have uh, two classes, 90% class one and 10% uh, class two, this stratify equal to i makes sure that the same distribution is both in a training and a test data set. All right, so now to use grid search CV, we need to specify the parameter grid. Um, it's called grid search because it searches over the grid of all possible combinations. So here we're searching only over the parameter called a neighbors. We declare the parameters as a dictionary where the keys are the parameters and the values are all the values you want to try. If there was multiple parameters, um, we would do a comma and then another key, another value. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, for scaling data, okay. Um, ideally, you scale your data into the cross-validation loop, and the way we and this is what we're going to talk about all of Wednesday. Um, I think it's Wednesday. Maybe next Monday, but I think it's Wednesday. Um, so now that we have this uh, parameter grid, or here it's just a line of parameters, we instantiate grid search CV. This is a model just like any other model in scikit-learn. So this is implemented as a Python class. We, we give it the model that we want to search, the parameter grid, how to do cross-validation, which is CV, which in the easiest case is just a number for say five-fold or here 10-fold cross-validation. And I also tell it to compute the training scores because it helps me debug my model. So this line actually just declares it. Um, to do the actual grid search with cross-validation, I have to fit it here. So the cool thing about this is the grid search has exactly the same interface as any other model in scikit-learn. So you can call fit and score and predict. Um, you can um, also, so this does all, basically all the steps we talked about. And you can look at what is the mean, best mean cross-validation score, what is the best parameters, and here I compute the test score. We don't really have to look at these, um, they're just sort of so that we see what's going on. But uh, in the end, you can just use score or predict as you would use with any other model. And so just to repeat the workflow, what it does is it does, it iterates through all the parameters, does cross-validation for each of them, finds the best parameter setting, then retrains the, a model on the whole training data set using this best parameter setting. If you want to have more details, you can look at um, gridsearch.cv results underscore. Oh, so I don't think I've mentioned this before, but uh, all the things that are estimated in models in scikit-learn, everything that was learned from the training data or what was created during fit ends with an underscore. So. Everything that's the result of anything will have an underscore at the end. So here's CV results uh, underscore. Uh, it's basically a dictionary of all the results. Um, it's more easy to look at it if you make it a data frame. And so these are all the columns in the data frame. It has like fit time, score time, the parameter of neighbors. Um, and then for each of the 10 splits, the training and test score. And then I visualize this uh, using Matplotlib. This again is a toy data set, so don't, don't uh, interpret too much into it. You can see here is the training score, so more neighbors uh, always makes the training score worse. And actually, if you look at the test score, in particular with the uncertainty of the test score, it's, uh, I mean, it has an optimum at five, but uh, it's not clear whether there's actually any difference anywhere here. All right, so this is sort of the, the standard workflow that um, I use most of the time and I recommend is try and test split and then grid search CV for adjusting your models. If you want to try different models, what I would usually do is um, call grid search CV several times and then compare the mean cross validation scores and, not, and only look at the test set once in the end.
So another thing you could do that's not as common is um, so we had these two splits. We had for inter validation, inter train validation and tasks, we, we um, replaced the inner split by cross validation. We can also replace the outer split by cross validation. Um, that's called nested cross validation. It's not that not done that commonly in machine learning. If you have very little data and you want a very robust estimate of how well your model does after parameter tuning, you can do use that. Um, but this takes even longer. So if I, for uh, the grid search I just did, I have the number of models I fit is number of cross validation folds times number of parameters. If I do next cross validation, it's number of outer cross validation folds times number of inner cross validation folds times number of parameters. So this can easily get out of hand, particularly if your model is long, is, uh, takes longer to train. Also, as we remarked earlier, this doesn't, if you do nested cross validation, it doesn't yield a model that you can apply in the end. So, um, it, and because each inner cross validation, each, each parameter search might have different uh, best parameter settings. What you get out of nested cross validation is this model will generalize that well if you tune the parameters. So, yeah, you, you can do this if you want. Uh, there's, not that commonly useful. Um, maybe another note on like times. Um, so the if your model takes a long time, people usually, or if you have a lot of training data, uh, usually people use the threefold split. Particular so in deep learning, no one does cross validation because. If you go from one week of learning on a GPU to five weeks of learning on a GPU, then the semester is over. <laughs> and so um, often you have big data sets to begin with, otherwise deep learning doesn't actually work that well. So just doing a single split is fine. Um, and so it's always sort of a, a trade-off between how much time do you want to invest and how much data do you want to invest and how good do you want your evaluation to be. The last thing I want to talk about is different cross-validation strategies. You do a threefold split. So you do training, validation, and test. Oh, but you don't do cross yes, okay. you do validation, but not cross-validation. So you don't repeat the splitting okay. because that might take too long. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about cross-validation strategies for uh, the rest of for the remaining time. Um, so I talked about uh, standard cross-validation. So here is sort of uh, some things that can go wrong with it. So if you just split your data, um, let's say you have three classes and you do you don't sh shuffle your data and you split it into three parts. And so if you, your data is ordered, then you will get a model that is zero percent accurate. Because your first split will have the first class, the second split will have the second class, and the third split will have the third class. And so you'll always test your model on a, a class that it has never seen before. Uh, this is like a very extreme case, but um, generally you want to make sure that all your classes are well represented in both your training and your test data set. And in second learn, this is called stratification. Um, and so you can do stratified cross validation. Um, which, similar to the stratify and train test split, makes sure that the distribution of the classes is exactly the same in all folds. So here you can see again, assuming that the data is ordered by class, and you like class zero, class one, class two, the first split takes uh, one third of class zero, one third of class one, and one third of class two. So if it was balanced, then uh, each, uh, each split will be balanced. This is actually what's done in classification. Sorry, it's, this is what's done by default for classification in scikit-learn. Um, so the defaults are actually, uh, by default, it used to be threefold cross-validation everywhere for no good reason. Um, that's deprecated and then zero dot. So it's gonna deprecated means it's gonna warn you and tell you things are gonna change and you should do something about it. 
Um, but so it's three for now, but in 0.22, it's going to be five. And really, you should never do three-fold cross-validation. It's not a good idea. Just always do five or ten-fold cross-validation. So search for uh, classification. Cross-validation by default is stratified. The train test split for reasons is not stratified by default. So you have to spe specify stratify equal to y if you want to stratify your train, tra train test split. And um, Yeah, and there's no shuffling by default. So if you run cross-validation and you run cross-validation again, your results will be identical. So don't do that. Um, you can do shuffling, and I'm going to show you how in a second. There's other strategies that uh, people use. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Um, so leave one out is something that used to be used quite a bit, which basically means you do k-fold where the number of folds is the number of samples. In other words, uh, you leave out each single data point, train the model on the rest, and then test on this data point. This takes an enormous amount of time because you train as many models as there's data points. Uh, also, it's even statistically not a good idea because your estimate will have very high variance. If you want to get a more, ac if you have, want to spend more time and get a more accurate um, estimate of how well your model does, a better idea is to do a repeated k-fold. So what it does is it applies um, k-fold or stratified k-fold multiple times, but with shuffled data. So you do k-fold, you shuffle your data, you do k-fold again, and so on. So you can do 10 times 10, uh, 10 times 10 fold cross validation, then you would have 100 splits of the data, and it's like a very robust way to do things if you have a lot of time. Uh, another strategy you can use is um, shuffled split, also sometimes called, uh, I think, uh, Monte Carlo estimate, where uh, at each iteration you randomly pick a part of the da data set for testing and a part of the data set for training. And um, this is kind of nice because you can select independently how much training data you want and how much test data you want. Um, if you want to do something very quickly, you can just use a very small part of the training data set, or sorry, a small part of the data set for training, and uh, this way you can get results very quickly if you don't care about being super accurate, which is often what I do if I just try out something for me. And so you can just, uh, you set training set size, test set size, and um, you can, then you can always run more iterations, you can run as many iterations as you want. Um, the downside of this is that, as you sort of see here, schematic, uh, some samples might not be in the test set ever, and some samples might be in the test set many times. If you do um, repeated k fold, every um, data point will be in the test set number of repeat times. That's not the case here. I have three more slides in one more minute, good. Um, so another thing that I want to just briefly mention is group k-fold. Group k-fold is very important if you have data that's not IID. So if there are some internal structure to the data. For example, if you're in a medical setting and you have multiple measurements for each patient, there's two things you could try to evaluate. There's um, one, given a new measurement of a patient that I already know, uh, how well will I do? And there is, if I have a new patient about which I don't know anything at all, how well will I do? And these are different settings for using your model. So, and these require different strategies. If you want to say, oh, I already know, uh, I assume I know my patient already, I know all the patients, and I just want to generalize to a new measurement of my patient from a patient that I know. You can do k-fold cross validation because you will have the same patient in the training and the test set, just probably by a random chance. If you want to generalize to a new patient, that means the patient will not be in the 
training set. So you want to do cross validation in a way that the patients are not uh, distributed among a training and test set. And so that's what group capable does. It's where you have basically an indicator of which group of data you belong to. So this could be patients, it could be servers from which you log your data, it could be websites, um, anything that sort of destroys these IID nature of, so if you have groups in the data and you want to generalize to a new group, you want to use group capable. If you have group data and you want to uh, generalize within the groups that you already know, you can use standard cross validation. I'm going to try and speed up all that. Okay, for time series, you have a similar problem. It's also not IID. And um, usually for time series, if you would do standard cross validation, you would destroy the temporal data, uh, the temporal structure of the data. It's much easier to predict um, today's data if I have yesterday and tomorrow, because then I can just interpolate between them. Uh, that's not usually how you want to do time series prediction. Usually you want to use the past and predict the future. And so there is a time series split that allows you to use the past and predict the future and not use past and future to predict the present, which is weird. Okay, so the way you use any of these is, um, so both the grid search CV or the cross file score have a parameter called CV. You, before I gave CV equal to like five or 10, instead of giving an integer, you can also give it a cross-validation generator. They're in model selection and there's a whole bunch of them. So I just talked through six or something. And um, these are all the Python classes. You import them, you instantiate them. You say, for example, if, let's say instead of str stratified cross-validation, I want to do plain cross-validation. Or let's say I want to use stratified with shuffling. I instantiate them and here. Or I want to use repeated capable stress validation. I say one to five splits and 10 repeats. And then in cross file score, I do CV equal to um, this object. And you can see here, this is for K fold, stratified K fold, shuffle split with 20 splits, and this is um, 10 times five fold. The last um, thing I also want to mention is there's another function called cross-validate. So we had cross -valid score before. cross -valid store just returns you the number of splits many accuracy values, and then you can compute the mean. Uh, cross, -val cross validate actually returns a dictionary that has like a whole bunch of information similar to what the CV results has in grid search CV. So you can use that, for example, to get fit time and score time and accuracy. And if you have different metrics, you can compute multiple metrics at once. So this is sort of a more flexible way uh, that can give you more uh, metadata. All right, I'm already over time. So thanks, everybody. And come up if you have questions.